All right, welcome back to the White Oak Collective Podcast. This is episode number 26. I'm running it without Austin today. He's out of town, took some PTO, and went to the coast. So um, we had this podcast planned forever, and he acts like I didn't tell him about it, but whatever. Um, Olivia, I just thought about this. I should have asked you before we started recording, but how do you pronounce your last name? It's Lappin. Lappin, okay. Well, I figured... It couldn't be that simple, but it is. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, yeah, we've got – you are actually our first ever female guest on here. We have Olivia Lapp, and she is with Quail Forever. So how are you, Olivia? Oh, I'm doing great this morning. A uh, little tired. We just got back from our uh, week-long trip at Pheasant Fest and Quail Classic up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So that was that was pretty eventful. So a little tired, but doing all right, recovering pretty good. So Yeah, well – Judging by your Instagram or Facebook or any of that, it looks like you don't ever stop traveling. So it looks like you're yeah, everywhere. Yeah, it's, it's been a lot. It's kind of sometimes a lot of traveling, and then it's kind of nice to be back home for a little bit. So, Well, tell us, just getting into it, tell us a little bit kind of about what you do, um, what got you into your field, and then if you want to, you can go into a little bit about Quail Forever. Sure. So... Weirdly enough, um, everybody thinks I am from the South or knew a lot about quail coming into the job that I'm in and how passionate I am about it, but I probably three years ago didn't know a single thing about a bobwhite quail. Uh, Didn't know what they looked like, what they sounded like. Um, Just, I honestly didn't even know they existed. So I am originally from Maine, um, got my uh, bachelor's degree at the University of Maine up there studying wildlife ecology and was very pro-wildlife, not much of a hunter, just liked being outdoors, being with animals. It's kind of the only reason I went into wildlife, which is because I loved working with animals. And basically throughout my bachelor's degree, if you want to be successful in the wildlife field, you have to do different technician jobs, which basically requires you to pick up and move around the country to get these different short-term seasonal positions. So spent a good three or four years just traveling around the country doing different summer positions in between classes. So uh, spent a summer studying seabirds and puffins on islands off the coast of Maine, Um, went out to California and did some backcountry like mule packing, fly fish guiding out there. I did some research on elk out there as well. Um, Did some turkey work in Delaware. So a whole bunch of different stuff just to kind of build your resume to be able to get either a job or get into grad school. Unfortunately, with the wildlife field, unfortunately and fortunately, you pretty much have to get your master's degree if you want to get a decent paying job because it's such a competitive field. I mean, who doesn't want to work with animals all the time? So it can be a little competitive. So um, basically was job searching while I was out in California and saw a position studying Bob White Quail at Mississippi State uh, under Dr. Mark McConnell. So applied to that, interviewed with him um, and basically picked up. It was supposed to be a six month position out in California, but picked up and left uh, after about two months to start that master's position. So came here again, didn't know anything about Bob White. I honestly, I joke all the time with um, my advisor, Dr. McConnell. I'm like, why did you hire me? I didn't know anything. How did I even interview? Well, I didn't know anything about quail, but it went well. And uh, he took me out to Prairie Wildlife here in West Point, Mississippi. That's where I did my research at. And they have some pen raised birds there too. So the first bird I ever held was a, you know, pen raised Bob White quail. And I was like, man, that is such a cool bird. And like the little noises they make and they're just really cute. So um, pretty much got hooked right then and there the first time I held one. Um, and then studying them just made it even more, uh, more exciting to work with them. So that's kind of where my passion grew. And I didn't grow up with those traditional stories you hear from people in the South where they had Bob White quail calling in their backyard and they used to hunt with their grandfathers. And I so badly wish I had those memories um, because I just love listening to people talk about those stories that they have um, and those memories that they have. So um, pretty, pretty bummed I didn't get that, but it's, it's at least nice to enjoy people's stories talking about that. And so I just graduated um, in May, uh, this yeah, this past May, uh, with my master's degree. Got um, two papers published right now, and we're working on a third. And then uh, basically transitioned into a position with Quail Forever, which was sort of the goal. Um, 
because it's such a great organization. So Quail and Pheasants Forever is basically a nonprofit organization. If you don't know a ton about them, um, they started as Pheasants Forever and then basically just started as a group of hunters that wanted to help protect pheasants and their habitat and increase their population. And then eventually they realized that quail numbers were declining in the southeast. So then they kind of made um, another basically sister organization, but it's the same organization as Quail Forever. Um, so now we have both of them and we're pretty much the same organization, um, just different funding and so forth. So. so this is, it just popped in my head and this is kind of off topic, but it's kind of strange to me, Pheasants for is Pheasants Forever, I guess, the only one of these organizations that, I mean, Pheasant is not a native North or United States uh, species, I guess. So it's kind of weird to have an organization that's for saving a non-native species. I never really thought yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely interesting. Um, and I think so much of it just comes down to that culture, especially in the Midwest and those, you know, the Dakotas and stuff. It's just such a big economic driver. I lived out in South Dakota in the Black Hills for a little bit. And I mean, once you get to the eastern side of the state, that's that's a big economic driver there. I can't remember how many people they said come in to those small towns every year to go pheasant hunting. So um, it kind of kind of makes sense but it is weird that yeah, yeah i'm pretty sure we're the only ones that do that so and they've been here so long now i guess it's just i mean there's probably not that many people that know they're not native so um, yeah definitely they're definitely a cool bird i've never um i've never hunted them but they're a cool bird at least to see out there so talk, uh yeah. just kind of just kind of jumping into some of the stuff we're going to talk about it, it you're talking about the stories of people growing up here in quail and, and hunting and stuff. And unfortunately for people our age, that wasn't really a reality. I mean, I'll see some quail every now and then, you know, maybe one covey or two, but, um, uh, and you'll hear one, you get all excited when you hear one, but it's not our grandparents and stuff like that. Yeah. They could hunt them. And that's all my grandfather did was bird hunt, but it's just, it's not a reality anymore. So, Getting into it, what, I mean, as far as your opinion, I guess, or quail forever, what's caused us to get to this point with the quail decline over the past, what would you say, 75, 50 to 75 years? Yeah, so great question. And it's interesting. I I know we harp on it time and time again in the quail world, turkey world, pretty much everything. We always say habitat. The number one thing is going to be habitat, and I like to say that first because there's obviously a million other little factors that contribute to it, but number one for sure, habitat. Now, historically, um, these small, I call them like mom and pop farms, your small ag farms, those actually supported pretty high densities of quail simply because it was a little bit of ground disturbance, you know, little bits of plowing, or you had these fence rows and hedgerows that just weren't farmed. Um, so we had these little places that had what we call early successional vegetation. So it's kind of after a disturbance, that first vegetation that comes up. So your forbs, your grasses, and not as many big shrubs and trees. So these small mom and pop farms were doing that disturbance, which helped to get that early successional vegetation, but it wasn't to the extent that we do farming now, which is great. You know, we're really productive in agriculture. We're really efficient in everything that we do, but unfortunately for wildlife, it's just not beneficial for them in any sense. So we're doing that, you know, fence row or field border to field border farming. There's just really nowhere for these birds to exist anymore. Instead of where we used to have, you know, those little fence rows that separated the small family farms and so forth. Now we just are farming pretty much everything. On top of that, you've got pesticide use and spraying. Um, so that's reducing the amount of insects, which for bobwhite quail for the first two weeks of life and similar to turkey poles, they're basically are relying solely on insects for food. So that kind of played into it. And then changing in timber practices, same thing, especially down here in the Southeast. Again, we've got really good at basically timber production. So we've got just basically tree row after tree row 
with no sunlight coming down through those canopies to get that understory vegetation growth that the birds need to hide in. I mean, if you go in any pine forest in Mississippi right now, you're pretty much just going to see a bunch of litter on the ground, pine needle litter, so maybe some leaf litter, maybe some invasive species coming in too, or some shrubby briars, but that's pretty much it. Um, so really nothing there for really any wildlife. So again, really great for, you know, our pocketbooks and great for farming, great for timber production, not so for like not so beneficial for wildlife. So that's kind of the main thing. Uh, a lot of people, and I always heard it was kind of what people thought down here, but I just came back a couple weeks ago from that Mississippi Ag and Outdoor Expo down in Jackson. And I can't tell you the number of people that came up and were like, oh, it's the darn fire ants or the darn I was coyotes. Ask about that because yeah, the, the fire it's ants uh, is what everybody likes to blame it on around here, it seems like. Exactly. And um, fire ants, my answer to that is just no, it's not. So it just so happens that the bobwhite decline sort of timed perfectly with the introduction of red imported fire ants and it's kind of your typical um, causation correlation story it didn't really cause the bobwhite decline it just kind of happened at the same time now there are places in the bobwhite range where fire ants are a little bit more of a problem texas seems to have a little bit more of issues there and i'm not an expert on that um, to be quite honest but here in mississippi where i did my research there were so many fire ant mounds and i don't think it i never saw any negative impact with the fire ants on the birds so i did where see did some that, where did that come from i mean do you have any idea like was that just somebody had that theory and, and it took off or yeah i absolutely i mean i have no idea and maybe that's yeah. just you know again i didn't grow up down here i have no idea where that came from and i'm i'm sure there's kind of a story behind it but i'm not sure where that came from and you know same goes for coyotes coyotes kind of get the blame for everything in the turkey world bird world and um I think there was a study done, I can't remember where, but it was like less than 2% of a coyote's diet was bobwhite quail. So yeah. they're not the main predator. It's the same thing with turkeys. You've got your nest predators, your nest, or I guess more your nest raiders that come in and they'll eat eggs if they see them. But yeah, um, predator populations have declined, but it's just not the main thing. And I always try to, you know, when I'm talking with landowners who are interested in trying to do stuff for quail, I always say, you can do predator management all you want, but if you don't have good habitat, it's just, it's not going to help anything. You really got to have the good habitat first. So those birds actually have a place to hide, have a place to have successful nests, um, have areas where the chicks can run around well and eat food. And then you can worry about your predators. Um, and even then predator management is such a complicated issue and it's so time consuming. And a, lo a lot of times we push, if you're going to do it, you really got to go all in on it. You know, once you put your foot on the gas pedal, you just got to keep going because once you stop, you're just going to have more predators come back in. So, yeah. um, well, and we, and it's, it is, uh, it's complicated. And a lot of times now it's controversial. Um, and that's what we talked about. We had Mr. Preston Pittman on last week, two weeks ago or last week. And we're talking about kind of little things you could do to help turkeys and, just like the quail the number one thing is habitat but if you do trap i mean it's kind of just like a little added bonus it's not gonna hurt there's no way it's gonna hurt um and you do need to do it right if you're gonna do it but the way i kind of think about it is anything's better than nothing so if you can you know even if you can just get out there a couple weekends a year during the seat during the trapping season and and try to catch a few i mean it's better than zero i mean you might not right. have that and, much of an effect but it's better than doing nothing yeah and especially if you enjoy it too i yeah. mean why not like if you enjoy going out there especially if you've got kids that are into it and you're getting kids outside that normally you know wouldn't be or whatever i mean it's just it's a great thing all together just to get people outside and if you enjoy doing it that's fine um it definitely doesn't hurt anything i will say uh and i don't think there's been research on it since this paper, at least that I may have missed, but um, there has been research that actually shows that when you're taking out certain predators, so you're targeting your raccoons, your possums, or your coyotes, it actually increased the presence of snakes and other predators, which snakes are actually a huge nest predator for bobwhite quail. Um, I actually had a full grown bobwhite quail eaten by a snake. And so we were radio tracking our birds and my technician went in, was like digging in a bush, trying to find this radio collar. And it was inside of a cotton mouth. 
So snakes are actually a huge problem. So the study found that when you were actually doing the predator trapping, they saw an increase in predation from snakes. So it's so it's just such a complicated issue where sometimes you think you're doing good, but then you're just increasing the abundance of another predator. So it's yeah. it's just so convoluted and it just really depends. Um, if you can, if you're doing predator trapping and you're able to do like point counts on your property to listen to quail and you can kind of get an idea of what how your quail population is fluctuating through time you know it doesn't hurt to do that too and just kind of see like is the trapping i'm doing you know making a difference am i hearing more quail seeing more quail and so forth um but yeah it's such a it is such a complicated issue but normally no if you want to go out and you want to trap some predators it's not it's not going to hurt anything just be aware that potentially you are actually changing the um density of other predators out yeah. there so so with quail is the big problem Hatching quail or getting quail to maturity? Or, I mean, I'm sure it's both, but what's the major issue? Yeah, so um, pretty much with any person you talk to who's in the science field, we say it depends on everything. So it absolutely depends. Um, in certain areas, it's going to be your nest success. You're not having enough chicks hatching, um, more failed nests and so forth. In some areas, so uh, my advisor, Dr. Mark McConnell did his research and he found that recruitment was the uh, most driving factor in the successful population. So recruiting, you're getting chicks, but they're not surviving into the next breeding season. So it just depends. Uh, Nest success is obviously huge, but then also, you know, overwinter survival, once you get farther north, that's a bigger problem. You know, we don't have to worry about harsh winters here, but farther north you go. Um, I think it's only about, and this obviously number varies, but around 25% of birds really even make it through the winter into the next breeding season. So it just depends on where you're located, uh, what actually is driving your, your population. What, what habitat type you actually have, what you're lacking in, whether it be nest cover or brooding cover or anything yep. like that. And yeah, and when it comes to land management, if somebody wants to manage for, for birds on their property, I always say figure out what your limiting factor is. If you walk out on your property and you look around and you're like, all right. Um, and for quail, it's kind of, and also probably for turkeys, it's kind of the 30% rule. You want 30% grasses, 30% native grasses, 30% forbs and flowers and, and so forth, your green vegetation, and then 30% of shrub cover for protection. If there is predator, they can hide in there or loaf in there during the summer and so forth. And then of course, some bare ground as well. So I always say, go out to your property, look what's out there and figure out what is the limiting. Do you not have a lot of grass? Here in Mississippi, we tend to have a lot of grasses and not as much what we call brooder and cover, which you need for turkeys, well, quail and probably and you, you touched on native and we'll go more into that in a minute, but probably need to clarify when you say grasses, we're not talking about going looking out in a pasture that's for grazing that's full of Bermuda and whatever else. We're talking about yeah. native grasses. Yeah, fescue and Bermuda, the things that we have in a lot of the pasture grasses here, um, they're just so thick. So if you think about a bob white quail chick, um, they're about the size of a bumblebee when they hatch, like a little cotton ball. And so if you go out into a pasture, that grass is so thick, there's just no way, even an adult can get through that stuff. And that's where we really always are pushing to have a little bit of bare ground out there below your vegetation so they can move around. But yeah, your pasture grasses, there's just no overhead cover for them. It's way too thick. The birds just can't really use it. Yeah, well, and that's, I guess, it's hard to explain without showing it, but when you're talking about like your Indian grass or your big blue stem or stuff like that, the way it grows, it grows in the little bunches, but then right next to it, it may have the bare ground and it may have a little distance between that and the next little bunch. And that's what you, I'm assuming that's what you would hope for. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. The little bunches pretty much all during my research, all my birds nested in a little bunch grass bottom. Um, I did actually have one bird nesting in a fe uh, fescue cow pasture we checked on it every day, and then the cows came and trampled it. So, unfortunate for that bird. But yeah. uh, most of the time, yeah, it's in those little bunch grasses. But they can really nest anywhere. And, you know, we talk about it in the turkey world, too. They There's certain things that they like, but they'll drop a nest anywhere yeah. if it's going to be successful. So, but, yeah, those yeah. bunch well, grasses are really they're great. They're going to try. I mean, just like turkeys, even if they don't have the habitat they need, they're still going to try. It's not like they're just not going to lay a nest. Yeah. So. Uh, and we're kind of jumping around a little bit, but I'm just, I'm so, uh, 
I'm not very educated in the quail, so I just keep getting questions. Did they re-nest like a turkey will? Will they re-nest like a turkey in the same breeding season? Oh, yeah. So we always joke that uh, in the bird world, well, my advisor says this, and I just laugh at it all the time. He says uh, quail are the swingers of the bird world. So they are at one point in time, and I don't know when this was, but historically we thought they were monogamous. Um, they just paired with one under uh, with one under individual, and that was where they nested throughout the season. But they actually exhibit what's called ambisexual polygyny, which so both sexes will mate with multiple individuals throughout the breeding season and then re-nest multiple times, usually up to two or three times. It just depends on the timing of the year. But of course, nest, nest success declines later in the season. So yeah. usually those initial nests are going to be your most successful, um, but they will re-nest also. Uh, multiple times and then actually which is really interesting and a lot of people don't know is that males will also incubate nests as well about 20 to 30 percent of nests are incubated by the male um, so then the female will go off and you know mate with a bunch of other birds and drop more nests it's it's really really fascinating yeah so that i mean i guess that could that would aid in survival you would think if if she's able to go lay multiple nests and and the original will get incubated Yep. That's yeah, it definitely nice. helps. That's, you know, their populations aren't doing so hot, but it's a good thing that they, you know, can re-nest so many times and just be breed with each other really crazy. So it definitely trying helps to, them to have that. To some more. <laughs> yeah. Um, so getting back to, we touched on native species, native grasses, all that. Um, and you talked about the way farms and farming practices and timber practices looked back, you know, in the early, let's say early 1900s. Um, but go back, if you can, further than that and when it was more of a truly native landscape back, you know, before we started farming large acreages and you had a bunch of, you didn't have as many invasives, you had a bunch of natives and, and how that worked, how that looked and the benefit to the quail. Yeah, so long, long ago, if you were to look at Mississippi and how it looked, it actually was a little bit more um, like tree, savanna, and you didn't actually have as much of that early successional vegetation until we brought in, you know, until we started having um, Native Americans that would do that land alteration. So they actually used prescribed fire and they started doing that land management to set that vegetation back to that early successional stage. So they were kind of the pioneers of using fire on the landscape, which really helped quail. And then, you know, through time, just using fire to manage the landscape, through time, um, that worked really well. And so Bob White populations were doing okay. You know, historically, way back before we were using fire and land management, their numbers, you know, they existed on the landscape, but we actually helped them boom and get even more dense um, through use of prescribed fire through Native Americans using it. Um, and then actually, like I was mentioning, those, those small family farms, you know, plowing up, disking up little areas here and there, that actually helped quail populations, you know, get larger. Yeah. Um, and then it's just, you know, we just become more efficient with everything. And, you know, I didn't mention urbanization, but obviously that's a problem everywhere with um, more and more houses being built. And so that doesn't help either. Yeah. So, all right, let's, you, you're with, I've, I've been trying to look into quail forever a little bit because I'm not super familiar with it because there's not really, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but around here locally, I mean, East Mississippi, I don't see, I know y'all are doing some work behind the scenes probably, but it, it's not your typical like NWTF or um, Ducks Unlimited or something like that where you're having all the, the big banquets and stuff, at least here locally. Um, but what kind of work, what kind of work is Quail Forever doing as far as trying to restore some of that native habitat or, or what kind of work are you doing trying to get back to that? Yeah. So yeah, like you mentioned, um, we're not, we don't have a huge presence here in Mississippi. And I realized that when I was out that, at that Mississippi Ag and Outdoor Expo, I think two people out of the 200 people I talked to had no idea who we were. So that's totally on us. You know, we need to kind of promote ourselves a little better. Uh, we did at one point have a quail forever chapter, um, up in the Starkville region, like kind of Mississippi state. 
it, I've heard it just depends. Some years it's doing good, some it doesn't. So I don't really know what's going on with that chapter. But for the most part, you know, we don't definitely not like NWTF or Ducks Unlimited down here. And hopefully that'll change. You know, hopefully we can get more people interested in the work that we're doing. Um, we do have two farm bill biologists and then a senior farm bill biologist. And he covers a couple different states. John Mark, um, he covers Mississippi, Alabama and Kentucky. And then we've got two other farm bill biologists here in the state, Robin, who covers a little bit more of North Mississippi and then Caroline down south. And so those are our farm bill biologists. So our farm bill bio biologist program through Quail Forever and Pheasants Forever is huge. I can't remember the number of farm bill biologists that we have throughout the country, um, but they're all over and they their main goal is to help landowners um, with whatever sort of land management that they want to do. So whether it's just actually out there helping them on the landscape or helping to enroll them into different government programs to get them funding to be able to do habitat management on the, on the landscape. So that's kind of their main role. And we've got yeah our two biologists here that are um, bouncing around to different counties, helping, helping on the ground, put habitat out there. Um, but yeah, definitely not as big as we could be here. But overall, yeah, so Quail Forever, um, I already mentioned, so we've got the Farm Bill Biologist Program, which is probably, and maybe I'm biased, probably one of the best things that we do, because we are really out there on the landscape, helping people with land management for free. So that's huge. Um, and then, but Quail Forever in general, it kind of has, its mission is sort of three different things. It's obviously increasing populations of bobwhite quail and pheasants, um, getting more kids on the landscape, youth in the fields, and then just overall creating more habitat, not specific just to quail, not specific just to pheasant, but just overall habitat. And we did at one point have a push to call ourselves Habitat Forever, um, or just kind of have another little branch called Habitat Forever, because so many people think we just do pheasant and quail work, but we do it for everything. So whatever a landowner is interested in, they want to make better habitat for deer, turkeys. You know, if you go out west, we do stuff. Um, or sage grouse, other game birds, that's what we're helping with. So it's mostly habitat work. The main yeah. goal is putting habitat out there, native vegetation. Um, and then also there's a big push, especially out West for increasing public access. So we've, uh, we have a bunch of partnerships out West trying to increase, you know, public access to these areas for, for hunting. So that's kind of another big push, but we're kind of all over. We do a whole bunch of different things. And um, if I could promote anything, it's, you know, we're not just quail and pheasant focus, you know, we, we want to get habitat out there and help landowners the way that any way that we can. So, yeah. And I mean, it's like, we've, we've kind of touched on it and we've mentioned turkeys, but I mean, anything that's good for a quail is going to be good for a turkey and a deer. So it's kind of, yep. they, they all can, imp your land can improve for all three simultaneously. It's not like you're doing work just for the quail or just for the turkey. It's all kind of, it all kind of goes together. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously every species has a little bit of a different vegetation structure that they need. So quail really only need, I mean, quail don't even need a tree. You cut every tree down on your property and they're going to be fine. They don't need it. Um, they like the grass, the forbs, and some little bit of shrub cover, whether it's blackberries, Chickasaw plum is huge here. People love those. So that's really all they need. Once you get into turkeys and stuff, you do need a little bit more, you know, bottomland hardwoods. You kind of need that tree mass. So they start to get into this little middle ground where they need the grass, the forbs, but then they need a little bit of trees, you know, to roost in and so forth. And then your deer, you know, you might need some more tree cover. So it's kind of like a, um, like a plane, uh, yeah. secession, vegetation successional plane. And so each one needs a little bit different, but yeah, overall, if you're managing for quail, things that you're managing for are usually the most limiting factor that you have for turkeys and deer. So it's, it's beneficial for everything for sure. So talking about landowners and, and what they can do, you know, you read, I've read all these management books and stuff and just kind of glance over the quail. And, um, most of the time it says you need a minimum of say a thousand acres or something like that to try to effectively manage for quail kind of like I was saying about the trapping where it's like every little, like it can't hurt. I mean, if somebody had a hundred acres and they just wanted to try to help quail, I mean, is there stuff they could do? I mean, are they going to make a difference at all or stuff they can try to do to, to help? Absolutely. So yeah, I think, I think it's with NBGI that it's like a, a focal area is like 1,200 acres. I could be wrong, but I think it's 1,200 acres is what you need for, a sustainable quail population. Yeah. Um, 
Or sometimes people will say that a quail needs about 40 acres for a home range. Um, and that's all well and great. You know, big landowners that want to do management on their properties, that's fantastic. But also your little landowners, they can do stuff too, because the main problem, especially here in Mississippi, is just that connectivity between landscapes. So you can have a big landowner with a thousand acres doing everything for quail, turkey, deer, but then all your neighbors are doing everything to go possibly against the wildlife. Yeah. So you're kind of just like a little, a little sanctuary, which of course attracts the predators in. So you've got that problem. So the main thing that I always try to push is just getting your neighbors interested. So if you want to do a bunch of work on your property, if if you're friendly with your neighbors, talk to them and see if they also want to do land management too, because sure, they might only have 20 acres and you've got a thousand, or maybe you both only have 20 acres, but the more that we can expand to get more and more landowners doing this work, it's just going to overall create more acreage for these birds. And sometimes even a smaller landowner is just a, like a connective landscape between two large patches where, you know, this big patch was isolated. And then you have another big patch farther away that's isolated, but then you've got a couple smaller landowners in between, and then that creates connectivity between them. And those birds, they do disperse, especially males. They'll disperse during breeding season. Um, I had one bird during my research that traveled about three miles, um, just on a whim, couldn't find them anywhere, and then finally picked them up about three miles away. So they'll disperse. So it's just, you know, and they were walking through people's backyards and everything. So every little bit definitely helps. Um, I had, a, I had a question in there and I, and I just lost my train of thought. Uh, okay. Oh yeah. So this may be a hard question to answer, but let's just take a hypothetical hundred acres and just say that it's perfect quail habitat. How many quail could exist on that hundred acres if it was set up just right? Yeah. So again, it depends what your neighbors are doing. That completely depends on everything. We usually say, you know, a lot of times I'll hear, I don't say we, I say we as in like we people in the quail world. I keep saying we, but yeah, general people in the quail world, what you'll hear is a bird per five acres or so is you're doing pretty good. If you've got, if you've got a large property and you've got one covey at this point in time, if you've got a covey of birds, you're doing something right. And what I always say is figure out where that covey's hanging out look at what they're using and then make the rest of your property somewhat look like that or get more parts of your property to look like that. So, you know, a bird per, you know, five acres is pretty good. Uh, Once you get into other areas like tall timbers in Florida, some places in Georgia, which people basically just strictly manage for quail in Georgia, your bird numbers are going to be more, you're going to have more birds per acre. Um, You know, doing point counts down there, it's, uh, it's, It's pretty crazy. I heard, I haven't done it before, but just talking with people, you stand there and you can't even figure out where the quail are calling from because there's so many of them. So it just depends. But here, you know, if you can get a bird for, you know, five or so acres, if you even have one covey of birds on your property, you're doing something right. So that's, that's a good start. Just a, what's an average covey size? I mean, what, what do they typically have in a covey? Yeah, um, I'd say anywhere between 10 to 15 birds. Uh, It just depends. And obviously they start to, they might get smaller throughout the winter, but they kind of shuffle around. So you might have one covey that's say 10 birds and then a couple of them, you know, get eaten or whatever, but then you'll have birds kind of shuffle in and they fill in the gaps. So anywhere from like 10 to 15 birds is usually a normal covey size. Now, if you only have a couple birds on your property, sometimes they'll covey up and make a massive covey. So it just depends, but usually it's somewhere between like 10 to 15 birds, I'd say. Okay. So this is, and then I've got a, I saw something I'm really pretty interested in, but first you mentioned the farming, the timber, the urbanization, this might, I'm just, just kind of wanting your opinion. Um, how can going forward, how can all of this coexist? And quail, I know that I know we're probably never going to get quail back how they used to be, but how can we all coexist and keep from losing quail altogether? Yeah, so that's something that um, quail forever and then some state state and federal agencies have really been pushing is what's called precision agriculture. And that's this kind of new technology up and coming that we're really trying to work with landowners who are into agricultural production to look into this. So the main basis behind that is uh, 
you know, working with your precision ag specialist, we've got one over in Alabama, Caleb Blake, I did grad school with him. And basically his job is helping landowners figure out areas of their field that are not producing well. So you've got these marginal acres that you're trying to farm, whether it's soybeans, corn, whatever it is, you've got these acres that just every year they're not producing a good crop. So actually the amount of input that you put in, you're actually losing money trying to farm these marginal acres. So what they could do for free, they'll come out and they'll look at your your production and they'll figure out the those marginal areas of your property. And then what they'll do is they'll enroll you into a conservation program. So whether that's a um, EQIP or CRP, some other government program. Um, and then we've got non-government programs too, options, or some people just do it on their own. They're just like, all right, well, I'm just not gonna farm that little corner because it's not worth it. It's not worth my time to farm it. So then putting that into habitat, that's, that's pretty huge. And Bob White quail respond really, really well to little bits of acreage being taken out of production and put into habitat. So there's, you know, one of the programs is called CP33, and that's a, a government program specifically focused on buffers around crop fields for Bob White quail. And I can't remember the exact numbers, but another researcher, Christine Evans, she did some research on this, and it was like 80% more Bob White once you put in field borders on the field. So little bits can, you know, help pretty significantly, but in the, in the ag world, that's kind of a big push right now is work with landowners, taking those marginal acres out and then paying the landowner to actually put it into conservation. So they're actually making money on these acres to not farm it. Yeah. So that's kind of a big push in the ag world of, you know, how you can still have quail on your property, but also be making profit on your, you know, your crop. And so then around, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, like, in the grazing world with cattle, there's kind of a push to move over to native warm season grass grazing. Um, there's a whole bunch of different benefits to that with native grasses, you know, reduces erosion. Their root systems are way better. So when you have drought, you don't have to deal with um, as much forage production loss for your cattle. So that's kind of a push in the, the cattle world. And then urbanization, I don't even know. <laughs> I don't even know where to go with that. That's just a problem everywhere. Yeah. But, um, you know, if you're, uh, if you've got a couple acres on your property and doing, instead of a typical lawn grass, put native warm season grasses, make your lawn native warm season grasses, forbs, wildflowers. And that's kind of a, a nice push that we're seeing too, which, you know, in areas like Mississippi, that's a little bit more possible, but in other areas, um, a lot of times, counties won't even you know towns and counties won't let you have anything but your perfect manicured yeah. green non-native lawn so so what i was going to ask was in my part of the world and and part of where you're at it's there isn't really any farming anymore it's all timber farming so in the in the timber world what what can we do i mean what to help yeah, and I will admit right now I am not a timber expert. I don't know a ton about the profits or the money that comes out of timber. But normally when we're working with somebody that has timber on their property, if they are able to take that basal area down a little bit and still be making whatever profit that they need to be making, that's usually um, that's kind of the goal in those areas. Because like I mentioned, quail don't need trees. But if you're wanting quail on your property but you also want to do timber production, is there a way that you can either... Um, do uh, different stand management that's going to be beneficial for quail. So usually that's reducing the basal area. Less trees, you're going to get more sunlight down, and then that's going to give you that understory vegetation growth, which is the main thing that you need. Um, and that can be, you know, taking out one row of trees and then leaving a next and just making those gaps between your tree rows bigger. So then you kind of have these linear strips of vegetation that can grow in there. And of course, you might have some non-native vegetation come in but you can spray that with herbicide. You can do seedings to get, you know, seed for native vegetation between your tree rows. Um, but a lot of times if you just spray those invasive species out, you'll get a good native vegetation response. So, or you could just, you know, do different management where you're cutting out a big block at a time and then letting that and managing that for habitat and then changing that. And, you know, of course, prescribed fire is always huge as well. So it, it's just kind of balancing your profitability and balancing having a low, what we say, like low basal area, usually between 20 and 40 basal area for, for timber production or lower. Again, yeah. quail don't need trees. So if you cut them all out, they're going to be perfectly fine. So it's just kind of finding that balance between what's making you profit, but also 
getting that understory vegetation growth for for quail, turkeys, or whatever other wildlife is out there. Yeah, and this is, I do not know what I'm talking about really, but um, we were talking about this the other week. With the timber market like it is currently and just really kind of non-existent, at least for pine pulpwood and stuff like that, I'm wondering if planting practices will change and not be so dead set on going back with your, um, you know, your 600 trees to the acre when you're, when you're replanting and all that. And, and maybe we look up 20 years from now and you've got a little bit different timber stand makeup because of the market, how it is now. Cause I know that back in the late eighties, early nineties, it was just, I mean, everybody was planting a pine tree. So now that's where we are now with, everything is just at least where i'm at you know so much is just monoculture pine and right yeah and i know a lot of people especially in georgia and like south mississippi a lot of people are you know they're realizing yeah the timber market isn't great but you know they like having the pine trees out there but they also really like the quail so a lot of people are transitioning over to taking out you know your loblolly pine is the most common you know pine that you're growing and they're transitioning over to longleaf pine which is kind of um, your more traditional pine, super adaptive to fire, super good for quail um, because it's so good with fire. Um, and so a lot of people are kind of transitioning over to doing longleaf pine restoration, which is, you know, that's great. Uh, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see kind of how that changes. And I know people that are just not even bothering with the timber anymore. And they're like, you know what, I'd rather have quail on my landscape, do hunting trips. You know, people will pay a lot of money to hunt wild birds. So yeah. that's kind of a um, well, and with the long too, leaf, so. I mean, the, if, if you're in the right area, which Meridian's kind of right on the edge, I mean, you can get paid to plant long leaf. So, uh, it's yep. kind of, it takes away a lot of your, what you'd be missing out on in the long run with, with cutting timber. It, it kind of takes that out. You don't have to worry about yeah. it as much. Yeah. And, it, um, and if you are questioning, you know, what to do with your property, if it's not worth it, or, you know, if you're wanting to get quail back, whether you reach out to a farm bill biologist, like if you type in on Google, find my local farm bill biologist, Pheasants Forever, it'll have a list of who there is, all their contact information, and you can just call them or email them and say, hey, this is what I'm looking for. Is this even possible? What's this going to cost me? Um, and then they can also, you know, you can also work with your local NRCS office. So walking into your NRCS office, say the same thing, what you want to do. Um, our farm bill biologists are housed in NRCS offices. It's a partnership. So if it's something that you want to do, or you're kind of just, you're just genuinely curious about what options there are, um, they can run you through all the different government funded programs, cost share programs that are available that you can keep doing whatever production it is on there or take it all out. You might make more money by just not doing any of it. So, um, it definitely doesn't hurt to just talk to a farm bill biologist or go to your NRCS office and just chat, like just chat with somebody, um, just to see what options are out there that might be might be helpful. And they for can you. help. They can help dumb it down for you because if you look, you know, if you go just go to NRCS website or something like that. I mean, those <laughs> programs they're kind of confusing as far as I what I they yeah. Do. It is very confusing. I am definitely not an ex- expert on the programs, and I swear every time I read through the paperwork, I get more and more confused. So, yeah, farm bill biologists are great with that, too. Through Quail Forever, they, uh, they'll they definitely try to make it as simple as it can be because, yeah, they, yeah government programs, they never make them easy to understand. So so something that I saw that I'm, I'm curious about is the uh, – I think it was on your Facebook. I saw the native – wildflowers or native grasses whatever planted up under the so planted in the solar farm what is talk a little bit about that program because we're seeing in my area which probably everywhere we're seeing more and more of these solar farms and when you go look at them I mean it's just a wasteland but then if you see that picture that you posted it actually looks like pretty good habitat out there yeah, so my my position, which I probably should have said this at the start, with Quail Forever, I kind of do two different positions. So I work on our on the Southeast representative for our seed program, so designing seed mixes for landowners that are wanting to do reseeding, get more wildflowers out there, more native grasses, and so forth. So I'm helping landowners put habitat out there um, and designing seed mixes for them. And then the other part of my job is um, working as a uh, on our rights of way and energy 
program. So working with, you know, solar, I specifically work really closely with, it's called Marathon Pipeline. So um, pipelines, but yeah, pipelines, transmission lines, solar, anything like that, working with those companies to basically remanage their rights of ways in a way that can be beneficial for wildlife. So creating that habitat. Normally we don't do anything on a solar panel. You know, you, you put the solar panels out there, great, whatever grows, doesn't matter as long as it doesn't get yeah. too tall or affect the solar panels. Um, it's great to see more companies interested in doing you know, native vegetation, managing the vegetation, whether it's under the solar panels, um, under the transmission lines, over the pipelines and so forth. So that picture um, is a great example. And it seems like you mentioned, I mean, we have a lot more solar panels going in, but the companies really seem interested in trying to make that vegetation underneath them be still beneficial for wildlife. So um, yeah, I'm working on designing seed mixes that meet their specifications. So again, making sure that the seed that we put in it doesn't get too tall um and so it's a great push the only thing that i'm worried about personally is managing that vegetation so as you know it's you know prescribed fire disking all those types of disturbances are super important for maintaining a good native vegetation component so we can go ahead and um seed all this great native vegetation underneath the solar panels you know, and wipe our hands and say we did great the first yeah. couple of years, it's going to grow and look beautiful. But then through time, if, if they're not managing it, if they're not spraying out noxious and invasive species that come in, I don't know what it's going to transition yeah. to. Um, I haven't seen any examples personally of people that have been doing it for many years. So it, I don't know what it's going to look like in the future. Um, but it's great to see that companies are interested in trying to do, you know, trying to do better, trying to put native vegetation out there. And then it'll just be, I guess, through time, we see how, well, you know, what kind of effort we have to put in to, to manage and maintain that vegetation looking like that year after year. So, um, yeah, cause you don't you just thinking about how a lot of national companies and or governments or anything like that, you, leadership changes and all that. And you don't want to spend all the time getting it how it needs to be. And then, new leadership comes in and say, well, it'll save us money if we just spray all that. And then exactly. So, yeah, I guess it is. So it's, uh, oh, I was just gonna say what's really interesting. So with Marathon Pipeline, who I'm working with a lot, the whole push is to actually save them money. So, you know, sure they want to do good, but also saving money is kind of the main yeah. goal of any business. So the main thing is, you know, for, um, for pipeline companies, transmission companies, they're out there mowing nonstop, mowing this vegetation because they can't have it get too tall. They have to have line of sight to the pipeline and so forth. So they're just constantly mowing these areas, which is incredibly expensive to get the manpower out there, the gas, everything that you need. So with transitioning it into native vegetation, that just kind of maintains itself. All you have to do is bring a backpack sprayer out there, spray out your noxious and invasive species, any trees that you see starting to grow, just spray them out. That's supposed to save them a lot more money than going out and mowing them all the time. So just try, trying to find ways to balance both, you know, making good habitat, but also saving saving people money too. Cause I mean, of course that's yeah. important. And that is, if they can save money, they'll keep doing it. So it's, yeah, it'll keep exactly. Them, keep them from changing it. So, um, I guess that stuff hasn't really been going on long enough to see the, I mean, have y'all been seeing increase in quail in those areas or hadn't really had long enough to study it or? Definitely not long enough to study it. So this past summer, at least with Marathon, this past summer is when we went out and we did um, initial habitat assessment, seeing what vegetation was actually out there in the first place. Then we kind of... Um, developed a plan to give them and say, hey, these are the areas we're going to target. These are the ones that look really bad. These areas actually look pretty good for wildlife. Um, or these ones actually had bobwhite quail on them. We had a couple areas that did have birds hanging out on the, the rights of ways. So at least with the specific program that I'm working with, we just haven't, we haven't seen it yet. But there's a ton of research. Um, I think it's out of Pennsylvania. They, they do a bunch of right of way research. So if you were to Google, you know, rights of way, benefiting wildlife or something like that. There's a bunch of work up in kind of Pennsylvania in the Northeast looking at that. And they have seen tons of um, benefits for wildlife changing the way that we're managing these rights away. So there's some research there, but like specifically, you know, with what I'm doing, we just haven't had enough time to see it. I would love to get uh, some more people interested in doing research on the right away. So, you know, what does it look like initially? And then comparing after all these changes, do we see more birds? Do we see more pollinators, wildlife, whatever, 
whatever it is that they're interested in. So it'd be really cool to see. And I'm really excited about kind of seeing these changes over time. And then hopefully it's really successful and we'll just have more and more um, industry leaders interested in, in doing this sort of work. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because I think it was last year and it, it, this hasn't gone anywhere yet, but I think it was last year we were approached about a piece of property that we have by solar farm and it's, it's great profit up front, but I was kind of hesitant because I'm just thinking, you know, you're taking, you're taking this much land away from wildlife and it's never going to come back. I mean, once they do that, it's, it's gone forever. But if you've got programs like this, it, it may actually end up being better habitat than say a pine plantation. So it, at least seems like it would help from that side of things to, to, um, lessen the blow of, of wildlife detriment there. Right. It's kind of like, which is the less of two evils, yeah. you know, what's, what's going to be the best. And yeah, I mean, uh, a solar farm that's got native vegetation underneath that quail can nest in and use that is probably going to be better. Yeah. than a pine plantation that has absolutely nothing underneath, but pine litter. So yeah, again, you know, necessary of two evils. I definitely, you know, just personally, it, it does stink when you see all these solar panels going in in areas that they are taken out of habitat. I don't know if you just saw the thing where that's a proposed solar panel on migration corridors out west and they're planning it right in the middle of a migration route. You know, not maybe not ideal. Maybe put it somewhere else. Yeah. But, you know, there's only so much that we can do in those yeah. instances. So just try to do the best we can with what's happening in the world and what we can control and whether it's your property or helping your neighbors or, you know, working with these industries to find ways that will save them money, but get habitat out there too. Yeah. So you mentioned that you're in charge of making these seed blends. If somebody, if somebody wants to try some of it on their property or just buy, you know, if they, do y'all just, can they just contact y'all and buy a bag of it or we all actually help them, um, set it up, you know, spray, spray before and all that. I mean, I'm not saying y'all will actually come out and spray, but can y'all tell people how to do all that? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I have people calling me pretty much every day, um, for, you know, designing a specific seed mix. We've got some online already. It's if you were to Google PF habitat store, um, we've got some pre-designed mixes on there. Now we haven't been making mixes in the Southeast really at all before I came on. So that's something I'm working on is getting some good pre-designed mixes up there. So somebody can just go on, they don't have to contact me and just order it right there. Um, we do have a bunch of food plot mixes up there. So if you are looking at um, trying to purchase food plot stuff, we've got, we do have a bunch of pre-designed food plot mixes. We've got a bunch of new ones this year. Um, so those are on there, but yeah, somebody can just email me or call me anytime. Um, tell me what they're looking for. And basically we just go back and forth until we have a mix that's in their price range and has the species that they might be interested in to uh, reach the goal that they're looking for. And we do the same thing with food plot. So if you're really looking for something for a food plot and you can't find it anywhere, it's super expensive. I can easily just send you a quote of what it's going to cost you through our program. And of course we're, we're a nonprofit. So it's not like we're trying to profit off of our seed sales. Basically any extra proceeds that we make through selling seed goes into our habitat projects and into our habitat work um, or youth events, hunting events, anything like that. That's, that's where that money goes. And as for, you know, technical assistance. So if you want help, you know, when do I seed it? Where do I seed it? What kind of um, preparation do I have to do? We can give that information. Um, or a lot of times I'll connect somebody with their local farm bill biologist, you know, over email or give them their contact information. So that way, a farm bill biologist, you know, if I'm not, if I'm not close enough to drive out myself, that uh, farm bill biologist will be able to go out to their property, look at it and say, you know, just go out there for free on a day, drive around with you on your property and just can help you on the ground um, with that kind of information. So we can do it over the phone, email, you know, reach out anytime. Um, and then, yeah, if you're interested and you're not already in contact with a farm bill biologist, it's just nice to have that person in your back, you know, in your back pocket, you can reach out to them really anytime. So, so as far as the food plot mixes, I mean, if you're a landowner that's planting just food plots for deer every year, I mean, it sounds like it's probably going to be cheaper buying it through y'all. And even if it's say the same price, at least it's not going towards a company's profits. It's going towards outdoor programs. So it's, it's kind of a win-win to, to go through. Yeah. For that. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I always push, you know, seed prices are constantly changing. Um, and seed prices just vary by species. You know, milkweed is crazy expensive. So it's so frustrating because I want to put it in mixes for monarchs and your pollinators, um, but it's just so expensive. So um, I always suggest reach out to different seed suppliers, see what is cheapest for you. Our main goal is just getting habitat out there. I don't care who you buy seed from, you know, and I'm not a salesperson. I never went into wildlife to be a, a businesswoman. Yeah. Um, so, you know, reach out, figure out what is the cheapest option. If we're your cheapest option, or you just like quail forever and you want your money to go towards habitat projects, yeah, reach out to me um, or reach out to a bi biologist uh, and we can help you um, design that seed mix uh, and figure out what you want. I mean, I even helped, uh, somebody up in uh, Tennessee and they're getting married and they're like, I really want some native wildflowers for our wedding. So I designed them a little two acre mix so that they could have some nice wildflowers for their wedding. And we, I mean, I do half acre mixes up to 300 plus acre mixes. So it doesn't matter how small it is. If it's something you're interested in, um, yeah, you can give me a call and, and I can help out with that. Okay, perfect. Well, that's, that's all I've got unless you've got anything else you want to touch on or talk about or um just anything no not that i can think of um definitely just if you're interested in any sort of habitat management you know reach out to quail forever you know we're not just focused on quail we're, we're really just trying to get habitat out there for whatever it is that you're looking for and just trying to help landowners reach their their goals and what, what they want so uh if you know just wanting to end on that that it doesn't hurt to reach out you know we're we're there to help so yeah, well, I think I learned more probably. Usually I do podcasts that I know a little bit about what I'm talking about. Quail was not one of them. So I think I learned more on this podcast than anyone we've had so far. Um, well, I really appreciate it, Olivia. I'm glad you came on. Um, I, hopefully, maybe we'll uh, get you back down the road and we can see some actual data on, on that solar farm and rights away stuff. So, yeah, uh, absolutely. That, all righty. Well, with that said, we will see y'all. This will post uh, March. I don't know. It'll post next week, whatever date that is. But I appreciate it, and we will see everybody later.